Hi, everyone from NDB Bank. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for connecting with NDB's investor update for the financial year 2022. Today's investor webinar will follow the same format like our prior webinars, where the bank's director and chief executive officer, Mr. Bimanta Feneviratna, will take you through a prepared presentation, at the end of which he will open up the forum for questions and answers. <clears throat> For the Q&A session, he will be uh, joined by the senior management of the bank. Participants are kindly requested to stay on mute throughout the presentation, and please use the chat option to pose your questions. Please choose NDB Bank uh, as the recipient in the chat option so that your questions will be directed to us. On that note, let me now hand over to Mr. Seneviratna to take the presentation forward. Thank you. Good, uh, good morning, all, and those who are joining us uh, from Far East, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, NDB Bank's uh, Investor Update. This is the update for the full year results. And joining me today are a couple of senior leadership team members, uh, Sue Endini with the Chief Financial Officer, Niran with the Vice President Treasury, Indika, who is Vice President of Business Banking and SME, Ishani, who is the Vice President of Project Finance, Vinoj, who is the Vice President of Wholesale and Corporate Banking, and Zian, who is the Vice President of uh, Retail Banking. Going on, So the the agenda is basically covering about the corporate profile, the operating environment, the financial performance for last year, and the way forward. And once we complete this presentation, we'll have room time for the question and answers as usual. Uh, so I think all of you are aware of the NDB, the profile. So I don't want to spend much time here. Uh, we have been in business for more than 42 years, fully fledged commercial bank, with also subsidies in uh, investment banking uh, and the capital market cluster, wealth management, stock booking, et cetera. Uh, and the performance have been also confirmed by some of the outside accolades, uh, such as the global finance, the banker, Award and also the last year for the first time, we also won uh, Euro Money Best Bank Award. Uh, without much ado, there, uh, let me move on to the uh, operating environment. Uh, we all know the challenges that we had last year. So, the priority of the banking sector, I mean, the entire banking sector at large, was to basically managing the challenges. Uh, I think that. Last year was the worst, most turbulent time. And this image also depicts how it, challenging it was the navigating in the turbulent time. And if you look at our annual report again, the theme is uh, the resilience of water, how the ability of NDB to be to absorb the external shocks and still manage like water. So the environment was very, very challenging. Uh, we all know the uh, severe inflationary pressure that we had, especially after announcing uh, the significant increase in interest rates from a low of 6.5% uh, SDF, which went up 14.5%. Uh, and the uh, treasury bills and bonds even much higher than that. We were trading around 30% or even above that. Inflation had the peak around 80% in 2022 December, but now it has come down to around 50%. The foreign currency liquidity was uh, the other challenge after Sri Lanka announced our uh, that default situation, the access to foreign currency was a bigger challenge. Uh, 
the entire banking sector was compelled to manage with our own cash flows. There was a very little interbank activities or nothing, interbank activities. So each bank were compelled to manage with their own cash flows. I think NDB has done well, thanks to some of our good exporters that have been continuing banking that helped us to manage the situation. By September last year, we completely managed to overcome that challenge and do well thereafter in terms of even supporting uh, essential imports. Another challenge was the sharp rise in market rates. Central bank uh, increased it by uh, 950 basis points, but the market rates went further beyond that. The, uh, the exchange rate was the other challenge, substantial depreciation of the rupee from uh, closely held 202 level, suddenly without any breaks, it went up to 380, almost 80% depreciation and those exposures which were in dollar denominated exposure in the bank book were naturally marked in rupees converted at high rates leading to a severe capital pressure the entire banking system had that capital pressure and that's where regulator came in and uh, offered the to the banks to use the capital conservation buffers that were available to make use of in times like that However, for NDB, there was no need for us to make use of the capital conservation buffer, but the capital ratios were impacted. So that also restricted our ability to uh, grow our loan book. But also consciously with the so many volatility, the interest rates, consciously we also looked at uh, not growing the balance sheet and there was certain attrition in the book without booking new assets, we wanted to manage the capital. We want to ensure that the loans are granted only to the deserving, more trade related, more working capital related exposure. So some of the ex ex uh, exposures in the personal banking or the retail banking, the project finance and some of the SMEs, we curtail uh, given the credit concerns and our inability to even take any long-term commitments in a very uh, volatile environment. Uh, in addition to that, you all know that the power crisis, shortage of world, uh, essential consumables in medicine, all those challenges. So we had to run a bank. We had to run uh, 14, 114 branches. Uh, the staff, more than 3,000 staff, getting them to come into office. There were challenges. Uh, so, so many things that the banking sector was uh, managing to provide the customer service as usual. So that's where our digital advantage actually helped us to grow our digital channel. So we saw substantial growth in our digital reach and also the volumes substantial, more than double the, the digital transaction volumes that was uh, processed through us. And there was a shift toward digital channel that helped us to bring our cost also down while serving the customers. So that was the background. And uh, one good thing is the IMF relief program that we now are aware that uh, by next week you have that uh, agreement most likely signed with the approval for the 2.9 billion bailout package. But our last year, all those uncertainties were there. So banks were reluctant even on the uh, holding on the more bond exposure, et cetera, because the domestic debt discount uh, concerns were there. So that's the landscape that we operate. So it's important to understand the challenging environment that we all face. So in that challenging environment, uh, how we manage, uh, and I must say that I, my full thanks to the leadership team and the staff with us, and also the customers who understood the position and supported in these challenging times. So we did relatively well, despite all these challenges. And uh, in terms of income and profitability, top line, we had 77% year on year growth, uh, on a clocking 110 billion in the gross income. Total operating income, again, 42 billion. That's year-on-year -year growth of 
uh, our biggest expenses was the impairment charges and 185% increase to your, the total impairments went up to 29.3 billion, mainly both on a loan book as well as the government investment. So as a result, though the top line was quite healthy, uh, the impairments had a big hit leading to a uh, reduction in pre-tax profitability around here. There's 80% reduction to 2 billion. Uh, however, there was a tax uh, element that got released so that post-tax profitability, uh, 2.9 billion, again, a 54% uh, year on year drop. But I must say that in given the challenging circumstances, achieving this was itself is an achievement. The balance sheet, uh, we crossed 800 billion and year on year there's 18% growth, 832 billion, the end of the year balance sheet. Uh, partly, actually I would say mainly due to the uh, exchange, the rupee depreciation, because roughly about close to 30% of our assets are in dollars. So that, that was the main reason because consciously we didn't want to grow our loan book in a volatile environment, in high interest rate. Only the essentials we supported, only those customers want to, I mean, customers also have to decide in high interest rate scenario what to do. So I think only the critical ones we supported. As the loan book, 10% growth year on year. Again, partly due to the exchange impact. But consciously, an uh, area that we uh, drove was the deposit side. So to ensure that uh, in any volatile situation, a bank key concentration is having the liquidity situation improved. So we were consciously building up our liquidity. And as a result, our advanced deposit ratio also improved below 90%, which is a very healthy position to be in in a volatile situation. You have to be always liquid in a volatile situation. So deposit growth was 22% uh, and we ended up with 672 billion. In terms of group performance uh, with, the, with the capital market cluster also contributing, group pass was 3 billion. Year on year, again, a 56% drop. Uh, while the total group assets stood at 840 billion. NIM, one of the key performance indicators, the net interest margin, that grew by uh, quite, quite good, 3.25% to 4%, uh, whereas the impairment charges, impaired loans to uh, ratio, or the stage three impaired loan ratio, that increase from 4.55% in 2021 to 6.2, uh, mainly due to the significant credit challenges that we all face with. In terms of capital ratios, since we consciously manage the capital ratios by certain asset reductions, et cetera, the capital ratios improved to 9.34 and the tier two, the total capital at 13.35, whereas the minimum was 12.5. Uh, and the tier one, the minimum was 8.5, whereas we had a tier one of 9.34. So this is a very high level performance overview. Moving on to the income side, more details about the gross income, 77% growth from 62 billion last year to almost 110 billion, uh, 47 billion growth there. Uh, coming mainly from the interest income from 52 billion last year to 98 billion uh, in 2022, 86% growth. And the interest expenses also a similar increase, but the quantum is lower uh, from 31 billion to 67 billion. So as a result, the net interest income, we had 42% growth uh, from 21 billion to 30 billion. Uh, balance sheet growth is only about 18%. Uh, 
However, you would note that the NIM has grown by 42%, mainly due to the uh, very active ALCO price in the uh, book at the right time that helped us improve on the NIM. Uh, in terms of fee-based income, again, uh, good growth there, 12% uh, growth from 5.6, net fee and commission income from 5.6 billion to 6.2. Uh, we all know that due to the currency challenges, some of the trade businesses, there was a drop in import, import restrictions were also brought in. So the usual trade operations were not the norm. And, uh, but despite that, I think things improved only in the last quarter. So we had to do a lot of catch up work. But we, with all that, uh, fee based income had a 656 million increase from 5.6 to 6.2. Our digital based income also supported in getting that. Uh, the other non fund based income uh, from 1 billion to 6 billion is basically mostly on the balance sheet management on the exchange side. And then on the non fund based income, uh, 3.7 to 5.7. So, all in all, the total operating income, we had 38% uh, growth from 31 billion to 42 billion, 11 billion growth. This, they the main biggest uh, charge on us, the impairment charges. So thought of spending a little bit of time there. Uh, from a 10 billion impairment charge last year, 2021, it almost tripled to almost 30 billion, 29.3 billion. So that's where the biggest hit came in. It came from Two main things. One was impairment charges on the investment book for, especially for the foreign currency denominated government securities, the SLDBs and the international sovereign bond holdings that we are having. Uh, and then the loan book. We saw the stresses coming in. Country's economy had a negative growth rate of 9%. Previous year also uh, negative growth. Uh, so naturally, with high inflation, high interest rates, negative growth rate, what, what next to expect is the impact on the credit quality. And so as a result, we were compelled to take uh, high impairment charges. Some were on precautionary basis, some were on need basis. Uh, and in terms of provisions made for the investment book, especially the foreign currency holdings, the impairment covers are in line with uh, anticipating the government uh, foreign currency debt structuring that is expected this year, soon after the IMF uh, announcement. Government would enter into the negotiation discussion with the bilateral and the uh, private creditors. So in anticipation of that, based on the gross financial needs, the domestic debt to GDP ratios, et cetera, uh, as at December, we took a view, which is in line with uh, the auditors as well. The entire industry took certain views and our impairments are in line with those views in terms of making the impairment for the uh, government investments. And the loan provisioning, as I mentioned, is basically due to the escalated credit risk in the current challenging operating environment. Uh, in terms of the KPIs denoting the asset quality, of course, impact loan ratio, the CHG ratio increased from 4.55 to 6.2. Uh, and the impairment cover, the impairment for the stage three versus the total stage three, that we were consciously building up from 32.8%, it has improved to 37%. As of now, it has further improved. Now this is consciously that we, we are trying to ensure that the impairment cover improves. One thing here, when you look at the industry and probably when you compare the, ND, uh, the NDB, uh, almost all our retail exposure are under the collective impairment models. However, we took, Consolidation in individual impairment, our threshold are lower to ensure that a large exposure is 
individually assess through multi-factor authentication to have a more uh, calculated, more refined assessment. And in that, bulk of our business banking or the SME portfolio are very well secured. There are tangible security that we're sitting on. So therefore, maybe relatively the impairment cover, you would see it's lower than the industry, but it's all after critical assessment. It has been vetted by the external auditors as well. But thanks to some of the strong security that we are holding on, especially on the business banking or the SME portfolio, that is why relatively it is lower than the industry. Uh, in terms of total impairment cover, it improved from 4.1% to 5.81%. Moving on to the operating expenses, this is where NDB did very well. I think the best in class in terms of industry. Our total operating expenses, the increase is only 9%. At a time that the inflation has gone up to 80%, at a time where the exchange rate has depreciated more than 80%, you can imagine how we have to manage our cost to reach a 9% increase only in operating expenses. So these are, I give a lot of uh, commendation for the team, staff, and also the digitalization initiatives that we did to ensure that the work the increased workload was tremendous. A lot of central bank uh, amendments, the customer queries, customer complaints in terms of loan restructuring, plus all the normal transactions that you have to manage in a closed economy. All that were handled with only a 9% operating expenses. The personal expenses, only 1% increase from last year despite we providing about 10% increment to the staff and also having some one-off payments into the, towards the latter part of the year, especially the uh, senior manager and below designations to support the staffs who were really impacted by the inflation and the uh, change of the tax regime. But despite all that, we manage the personal expenses quite well. Depreciation and amortization remain the same. However, it can be higher this year with the co-banking upgrade expenses also coming in. <clears throat> but the main, the other expenses from 3.9 billion to 4.8, though it's 22% increase when you look at, now these are the controllable expenses still, but when you look at the inflationary pressure and everything, still managing this is remarkable. So as a result, our total Cost income ratio was still below 30%. It actually is 26.6%, reflecting both the uh, cost efficiencies and also the revenue enhancement that we had. In terms of balance sheet, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 18% growth in total assets. Investments, you would see a quite a sizable increase in investments. Uh, from 146 to 199 billion, 36 percent. So, of the total assets, actually, the composition mix moved more towards the investment side rather than the loan side because consciously, one was the credit concerns, the environment. There was no less appetite also for the borrowing at very high rates. So, the loan book was uh, not grown aggressively. However, with the deposits coming in. We had to deploy those assets in the investment, mainly the government builds bonds, but there again, we were consciously booking most of them in bills. Uh, so that's where uh, relatively higher growth compared to other years in the investment side. Total deposits, 22% growth. Borrowings, there's very negligible. We settled all our foreign currency obligation during the last stage itself, there are no, uh, despite all the challenges, we settled all that. Whatever the increase is probably the dollar uh, appreciation. The, so otherwise there was no increased borrowings. It's only the uh, exchange impact. And the total equity input 
from 59 billion to 64. <clears throat> so overall, uh, the financial performance, the investor ratios, as typical to the our <clears throat> stock market behavior, the closing price of the share came down. It's 32 rupees, but however, it has subs subsequently improved. Uh, as of now, it's around 52 rupees. Uh, hopefully, that thing should pick up with the IMF program also announced. Uh, earnings per share had a big hit from 19 rupees to 7.65. ROE again, substantial reduction from 12.27 to 4.75 and ROA. Uh, book value per share remained same, almost 165, 167 range. Price earnings increased from 3.5 to 4.18. The price to book value is the biggest drop, but this has slightly now improved. But as of December, it was uh, 19 cents. <clears throat> In terms of uh, capital and liquidity position, I think I touched on this. So, all in all, the, the common tier one capital ratio 9.34. Uh, bank level. About 70 basis point reduction from the last year, mainly due to the exchange impact. And the total capital ratios uh, from 15.4 to 13.35. Uh, there were some debenture payments also during the year. That was the one key reason for the tier two level reduction. And you'd have noted that we have already announced tier two level uh, capital raising. Uh, 10 billion uh, that where we have provided room to uh, take the option during this year rather than limiting it to a particular time frame. And we are waiting for the interest rates to come down further. There is no major pressure on the capital, the tier two level capital ratio for us. So I think it is into our advantage to wait till the rates further improve and then go for that. Uh, so that will further strengthen the tier two level capital. Statutory liquid asset ratio, despite the minimum is 20, as I mentioned, we were consciously building up our uh, liquidity level. So as at the end of the year, it was 27.2%. And liquid coverage ratio very much above the regulatory requirement, minimum requirement of uh, 100%. We are at, uh, actually minimum requirement is 90% now, we are at 297 and liquid coverage again, uh, minimum all currency is also 232 versus minimum of 90. And the uh, net stable funding ratio, whilst the minimum requirement is 90%, again, we are at 130. So we have been basically improving on, if you look at even the year on year, from 118 to 130 year on year, liquidity has been improved. Even the liquidity coverage ratios from uh, 170 level to 232. Uh, so that's consciously that we have been building our liquidity position. So then it's about the way forward. Now, so this is the background. This is the achievement. But how you move, I think the most of the volatile situation, it's last year, but it's still volatile. We are still not out of danger. There are certain questions on the uh, IMF structuring, how the Sri Lanka would enter into the next phase of debt negotiations with the uh, bilateral creditors, private creditors, there will be intense level of discussions there. So still there are uncertainties, but despite that, how we move forward, be a responsive and agile entity that NDB is, and how we are going to move forward. So 
couple of key things, uh, key thoughts I just want to leave with you uh, before moving on to the question and answer session. One good thing is the IMF relief package that has been now announced and looking forward to the board level approval next week that would release uh, 2.9 billion over eight tranches. Hopefully there'll be a, the first tranche can be something higher. But more importantly, that would also put uh, the country into a certain framework, a long awaited economic revival, policy level additions, SOE restructuring, improving on the government revenue side, tax changes that we have seen, the utility prices that we have seen, the removal of subsidizing the fuel, et cetera, that we have seen. All those are the right directions, long felt needs. Unfortunately, Sri Lanka, due to a lot of political pressure, never took that firm decision. So we had to had that struggle last year. People had to go through all those challenges for people to realize the need. So hopefully that trend should continue. If we have to come out from this current economic crisis and get our country back to our uh, growth momentum that is expected. This year, the, still the expectation is the domestic GDP to have a contraction again, maybe around 3% or a bit, bit less than that. Central bank expectation is at least by the first last quarter of this year, things to revise. So we are also hopeful of that. And in that context, the interest rate reduction that we have seen in the last two months, almost 500 basis point reduction in the AWPLR, and similar reduction, substantial reduction in the treasury bills, bonds, all that would help to have some acceptable level of interest rate so our customers can basically continue their operations, not as paying high as close to 30%. And in that context, the recent uh, appreciation of the Sri Lankan rupee from a high level of 365, it came down to 325, but yesterday, again, it has increased up to about 335 range, maybe due to smaller transactions, but based on the demand for the importers, hopefully not today, if that, that is managed at the same level. We are hopeful that the exchange rate would also come to something reasonable for country to have an overall benefit as well. We saw during the last uh, two weeks where the exchange rate came down substantially, central bank also picking up uh, dollars to build up their reserves, which is a good sign that has helped the country to get some usable reserves going up. And uh, hopefully with the IMF program getting announced, there'll be an unlocking of some of the other funding that is lined up for budgetary purposes, especially the World Bank Fund, the ADB funds that are expected to come. Hopefully that inflow would also help to get the exchange stabilized to an acceptable level so that we can continue. So we are looking forward to that. In the meantime, bank, how we manage is basically looking at our customers who were impacted due to two, three years of challenges the East Tax Act, the COVID challenges, the lockdowns, plus when they came out from this moratorium, the interest rates, they have gone up, skyrocketed, the inflation, all that. So they actually came out from the moratoriums in a very challenging time. So how will you support them? Most of these falls are not due to them, but the economy as a whole. So how will you support them? So that's one of the key priorities where we have set up our remedial unit to support them, guide them, and help them because it's all to do with sustainable banking, not that we uh, put them into difficulty. So that is one of our key priorities to help these customers hold their hands and then support them, be more flexible to support. So, and the preserving the asset quality is another priority. And we will continue to be more focused on digital channels to have our cost rationalization 
so that we can provide recent profitability to enhance their shareholder returns. And we continue to have our liquidity level at a very strong level because still we are not the country. I mean, when I say we here, the country, the industry is still not out of the woods. Political uncertainties are there. We see a lot of pressure in terms of uh, the tax, high tax regime that we have. These are necessary decisions, but on the other hand, people also have to understand and support these initiatives to ensure that we sail this and come out from these challenges in a much more stronger we could there's no way that we can turn back and uh, default another imf bailout package that would be the end of the story for the country i good to see the bilateral creditors especially china india and the paris club supporting there but importantly for the bank or the banking sector the international sovereign bond exposures, et cetera, how you manage it, how you negotiate, all that are still key challenges, whether there would be uh, domestic debt reprofiling. If that is the case, how would that be, have an impact to the entire industry? But these are the uncertainties that we have to tackle within the, in this year. So that's why we, we are preserving the capital where possible. We are having a liquidity level as much as high. You can have high liquidity, then there's another cost of having liquidity also is a cost. So you have to have a fine balance in managing to ensure that shareholders are also provided with good returns while it's also import, importantly keeping our customers also to ha help them to ha handle their transactions, especially in terms of foreign currency, we had seen quite a good growth, good improvement. We have been working on improving those flows, especially the export-oriented organization. We have been onboarding, we have been supporting, even growing on our remittance business. We just concluded our co-banking upgrade to the latest system. In, in January this year. So that also gives a lot of uh, mileage, a lot of opportunities to do more on the digital side. So those are the things that we are working on while managing still the current challenges. So with this, uh, I open up the session for question and answers. So, Please feel free to raise your questions. It will be filtered and brought to our attention and then we will provide answers. So with me, my fellow panelists, uh, the leadership team members that I mentioned are here to take such questions. Thank you. <clears throat> so there's a question um, on at what rate are you hoping to issue the coming corporate debt securities given the volatility wouldn't it make sense to let an auction set the rates there are a couple of questions then another one on what's the likelihood of a domestic debt structuring and so let me take the first two uh, in terms of corporate debt securities, I think, as I mentioned earlier, we are waiting till the interest rates stabilize further. We see rates coming down. Uh, so, and since we don't have that much pressure at the moment in terms of tier three, uh, tier two level, uh, the luxury of waiting is also with us. So, anyway, that that's coming for our EGM on thirty first. March and thereafter only we can go for the uh, pricing checks and all. So we would wait for the right time and raise it. With regard to the other question. Yeah. 
uh, domestic debt structuring. It's, I think it's all to do with the gross financial needs calculation that the government is coming up. And I think it's important to see after the IMF program, the central bank would also make certain announcement of those uh, details. So we'd like to wait and watch that. Uh, but our take is very unlikely that the overall debt structuring may be a reprofiling, but it's too early for us to comment openly in a forum like this. So we are waiting, we are getting ready. There's another question about the net interest margin. The current environment are very high. And is there any risk of sudden price for on the lending deposit side on the business? Iran, you want to comment on? Iran is our uh, yeah. of question. Actually, I think the yeah, man, NIMS have really improved it among the industries mainly driven by the excess funds, uh, plus funds being invested in the in the domestic uh, fixed income uh, markets like the government bills and bonds because uh, currently if you look at it still there is a huge difference between the AWPLR and the and the treasury bills and treasury bond rates so which we expect to converge in time to come but there is DDR and other debt restructuring uncertainties are uh, 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 taken off so unless otherwise the credit appetite uh, increases and with and some reductions in the interest rates and we feel that these margins may remain for a while uh, during this year Iran, another question probably you can answer can you comment a bit on the interbank market and how it has been operating as of recent yes actually we have we saw the interbank uh, in uh, or started to operate after after quite a long time and in the, during the last two weeks uh, with the central bank uh, taking the band off and also, also i think a lot of credit should go to the central bank and the governor for managing it that way because uh, they didn't take the band off immediately but gave certain uh, they gave widen the band and also gave ample room for the market to adjust and also those signs were also informed to us that they will very soon uh, they will take the range off and also the timing is also was i think was quite correct because uh, that's the time where the import demand was also much less. And uh, even what we felt even in the last couple of months itself, the, we saw the demand side was uh, really uh, coming down with the interest rates at a high levels and also the, with the credit demand also being not very high. So the timing wise also, it has been quite good. And also we saw a little bit of a panic from the exporter side also. And then there were certain plans who have brought in the dollars also sometime well before the these uh, mandatory conversion was effective. So they also started to convert somewhat of their balances. So that also had a uh, back to the exchange rate. So it was more or less uh, uh, more or less a lack of demand, and uh, that the exchange rate really came down. So, uh, and also the liquidity also has improved in the markets because we, we have seen the worker evidences and the tourism sector inflows really increasing. So, uh, and I, we feel that the sudden move, upward move over the last two or three days could be temporary. And we think uh, in the medium term that the exchange rate should come down a little bit more and settle at a reasonable level. I think probably still, I think there's more room for it to uh, improve further, I mean, for a rupee appreciation, for further rupee appreciation. Thanks, Ran. There's a question on uh, of the non-performing real estate loans, how much has been post-sold? Is there a risk of the market value being much lower than the collateralized value? And how many months in areas are they on average? Uh, I think that we all, the entire banking industry was uh, requested to have these moratoriums in place till the end of last year. And uh, in terms of forced uh, foreclosure, there again, there were certain regulatory directions in terms of minimizing it. So the market opened up only in the last, of probably December and thereafter. Uh, so we also had uh, quite a high number of uh, loans that have been for, for sold. Uh, but in terms of the market price, 
I must say that we have not seen that much of reduction in the collateralized value compared to the valuation. I think in some cases, some prices have gone up because the cost of construction, especially the buildings and all have gone up. Uh, so okay. with the exchange impact, the inflation impact, all that is reflected also. Uh, so we are not seeing a big drop or in some cases, actually, a certain appreciation as well in terms of the collateral that is offered. Uh, there's a question on what is your loan book growth assumption for 23? And from which sectors you expect the growth to come in? So as I mentioned, it's a, the economy should also grow for us to consider loan growth. So we, have, we would have a cautious loan growth uh, not much, but the areas that we would concentrate mainly on the uh, corporate banking or the business banking, where there is uh, trade related, where is, uh, there's working capital and export oriented firms. Uh, we would like, uh, in fact, we have come up with a RORAC model as well for minimum return for us to book an asset. So we do measure before we book an asset. So it would be a cautious growth in terms of uh, loan growth and uh, mostly coming from the corporate and some selected upper end business banking who are into trade and export business. That's a question on is NDP targeting a higher loan provision cover going forward. We would consciously improve on this cover certainly but as I mentioned, the key differentiation is that most of our SMEs are secured, so there is a uh, value assigned to that when you apply uh, the impairment assessment through multi-factor model. However, consciously, we would also build up because the, still the credit concerns are remain, specifically the specific ones, we would be certainly increasing. In fact, some of the older uh, large corporates and all the NPL or the provision cover is much higher. Some are close to 70-80%. But in overall context, the average is 37. Okay. Of course, there's a question about do you foresee a provision reversal on account of SLDBs? I think, Niran? Yeah, SLDBs definitely yes, because uh, we are now the settlement pro there is a settlement process. Where the where the central bank or the, or the or the treasury is providing rupees instead of the US dollars, so uh, already so whenever that rupee settlement takes place, there is a reversal from the from the uh, from whatever we have provided, and also there can be even from the exchange rate also there can be some kind of an impact there when because the the exchange rate. At which we have provided, but if the, if the dollar rupee exchange rate appreciates, if it comes down further, that then there can be uh, technically there can be some reversals. But overall, it's mainly because of settlement. There yeah, is settlement process right now for SLDBs, unlikely in the, uh, not like in the uh, international sovereign bonds. There's a question on in recent months, what is your fixed rate borrowing cost for an average borrower on five year facility? That has been coming down, so maybe around 23 24 yeah. percent. Again, it's like uh, what's happened is like again, the bank has an internal pricing uh, policy and a model which is driven from the market rates. So, effectively, what we have seen is that the demand is also very much less, and we are also very concerned that even at these high rates, whether pertinent to lend currently. So, it's really driven by the internal pricing model and the risk appetite. The, of the bank. Right. So just to add, we are slow in growing that consciously uh, because as Niran mentioned, uh, the customers who are getting into fixed rate borrowings at these high rates also, they are consciously coming in for that borrowing or just because the loan is that they are, they are going to borrow. Unless the repayment capacity is really good, we are also conscious not to book much, especially on the high rate regimes. 
Uh, there's a question on, has there been an uptick in hotel sector servicing of loans in recent months? Yes, certainly there is. Uh, we see with the tourist arrivals picking up uh, with the country in terms of fuel availability, the power crisis moving out and all. The hotel sector is getting back gradually to the normal, normal operation. So most of them who are holding on to their negotiations, taking the cover under the moratorium are now coming and working on the uh, restructuring that we have been proposing. So yes, there is uptick in uh, them servicing and also looking to service, which was not in earlier available because they also was not sure about the future, but normalcy coming gradually on the tourism side and all, there is interest for them also to come and negotiate where they all, all know when the tourism sector picks up, they also want to ensure that the bank debts are also really addressed. Otherwise they can't borrow more when on the crib recording and all. So they're also keen to come and negotiate. So there is uptick there. That's the question. They're saying a bank has anything lined up in terms of capital inclusion on the tier one. I think I mentioned about the tier two. Tier one, yes, certainly. Yeah, that's an area because for us to grow, we need to work on the capital side. Uh, so there are a couple of interested parties who have raised their hand, but we are also looking at the options. I think more would come in after the IMF correction is in place. So we were keeping the timelines probably towards the latter part of this year, one situation, the, all the uncertainties on the uh, debt restructuring, all the, all the uncertainties are cleared. I think that's the time. Otherwise, uh, with the uncertainties, if you go, we may not be able to justify the uh, right price for us to get the new capital infused. Uh, so we are waiting for the right time to go for that capital infusion. That's a question, Iran. How much of a still DBs are maturing in March 23? And if authority indicate that it will be paid in LKR. Of yes, course, definitely. they have been paying uh, SLDBs all this time in LKR, uh, that also LKR bonds. So I think this time also it would be most Except likely most LKR likely. bonds. There's a question on geographically, what regions were the most hit in the university, in the country during the period? And conversely, what are the best? Dick, you want to take that? Uh, I must say that, I mean, we were uh, visiting our North and East branches last two months. And they are the area that, I mean, the economy is doing well, I would clearly rate North and East area. One is they are not impacted by the false crisis or the power crisis, all that. And, and even during the height of the war, they were used to that. And very hardworking. And uh, I must say those are the two areas that uh, if they are going to come up faster in terms of regions geographically, those two areas would be uh, really come out much faster. Impacted regions. I think uh, other. So other areas is across, we cannot specifically say one particular region, if you look at SMEs, we see stress in all regions. But same time, uh, uh, we'll see some areas like Northeast and some other areas where now the cash flows are coming and the business are picking up. So that's a good sign. If this continues uh, by year end, we hope that uh, even small level SMEs also will pick up. Okay, there is a question on stage two and three increase has been around 50% year on year and stage two as a percentage of gross loans are around 31%, which is one of the highest in the industry and also stage three is around 11%. Why has this been higher compared to other banks? Uh, so when do you want to? Uh, so I think, uh... To look at uh, 
look at the stage three composition that's in line with the uh, other banks, but it would take the stage uh, two and three together. Uh, yes, it's high because our stage two composition is high. That is because we actually evaluate the potential loss and also we have identified certain risk elevated industries and on a conservative basis we have classified. At the same time, when it comes to impairment, uh, I can see you also mentioned the developed collateral and the expectation of cash flows because we have evaluated these customers in a, uh, on a specific basis and we have identified the business viability. So with that, the provisioning may be less. Uh, but our evaluation, we cover the entire stage two, uh, two and three, which is a higher composition. So that's the reason for that. Okay. Uh, that's a question on what is the exposure to leisure and construction sector? Uh, leisure or the tourism, I think total book is, I think I, I've answered this question earlier as well, around four and a half percent. Uh, construction, uh, do you have industry numbers? Five percent. Uh -huh. So it's about five percent. So one and a half percent for Asian, five percent for construction. And there again, the construction, like the most of our exposures are very specific project based. So I think we are much in control of those projects because we don't have bulk. OD facilities or uh, to to fund it's all project specific so it's much more well structured. There's a question: Any idea if maximum shareholding percentage in banks will be revised upward for strategic foreign investors? Asking this as it's affect core capital raising issues. Uh, I'm unable to comment uh, on that. It's uh, up to the uh, regulator also to look at. But in, we had seen in some cases, Central Bank has basically uh, flexible, especially when it comes to the foreign strategic investors. Uh, so yes, and given that need to attract more capital, all the banks would be going for capital attraction. Uh, I think it makes sense also to have some higher percentage holdings, uh, because I can't understand why it is restricted, uh, especially for foreign investors. So, but I, it's difficult to give any comments on that other than sharing my opinion. There's a question on what's the breakdown in between variable and fixed loans and expectation on loan growth. So I think that's an area that, uh, the fixed rates, uh, there is a certain exposure which is under fixed rate, especially on the, uh, say for example, housing loans or the leases, which are at fixed rates. Uh, and these are committed facilities unless you are in OD situation, we, we are not supposed to make any changes on the rate. So apart from that, most of the other exposures are on floating uh, basis, uh, either AWPLR link or the uh, transfer pricing link. So the key areas are the uh, lease portfolio, the housing loan portfolio, and also some of the personal loan exposures. That's a question, NDB is still growing the deposits at a higher rate. Is this going to continue? I must say that we are not growing at a higher rate. Uh, if there's a, a perception like that, should not be the case. Right, Nira? Yes, definitely. We are paying actually sometimes below market rates. I think that's where our privileged banking, uh, one of the, I think the best franchise so far, and also retail also has done a great job in getting more granular deposits. Uh, so we have been, and then also broad base in the deposit base, rather than looking at uh, providing a high rate and getting a large chunk, 
because the risk of that losing is also high moment somebody offers a high rate that deposit moves to another so certainly uh, that's not the case but we have been building our liquidity by growing deposits uh, and naturally the tendency in the market last year was uh, the most of the savings got converted to fixed deposit even because there's a gap was quite significant so there was a tendency some of the savings customers they moved into even three months deposits because still the gap was very big compared to what they get in savings. Uh, but certainly we we consciously didn't offer high rates. Uh, so, uh, but grew our deposit base mainly on using the granular deposit, especially through the network, branch network, and also the privileged customers. There's a question, is there a possibility of ISP2 will be repaid in LKR, just like SLDB? Do you think the external euro bond holders will be okay with that considering equal treatment principle? Uh, good question. Uh, now, we had, I mean, the, about 10 banks are holding on to ISPs. Uh, and I think all in all of the total ISPs issued, the banks, local banks holding is about 12 to 13 percent. That's a sizable portion. And we had that opportunity to meet some of those uh, uh, advisors for the private creditors uh, on the on the private ISP holders. Now they they are quite open to that option as well in case. Uh, ISPs are paid in rupees for the local holders, uh, like the SLDB. So the what is the available dollar composition for payment of theirs remain intact. But it's most likely the government uh, how the treasury, the finance ministry negotiate with these bondholders. So my gut feeling is there is a possibility of some portion of these. ISP is being paid in LKR for the local holders to ensure that the equal treatment principle is applied. They might give the same option for the overseas ISP holders, but unlikely they would take it uh, so that the equal offer would be there and some banks based on their ISP holding as well now for, for banks to accept our entire ISPs, you need to have NOP limits you need to look at your foreign currency liquidity. All that have to be considered, but the option, there is a possibility. Miran, there's a question. What is the interest rate on bonds used to settle SLDBs? There, there is a standard policy there. The, generally, they give it uh, the, the previous, pre, uh, previous uh, auctions weighted average rate. So that is the standard which has been uh, practiced over the over, the, over the, all the maturities. So uh, if they are to give any maturities in the recent ones, they will go back for the very recent uh, treasury bill, uh, sorry, treasury bond auction and the weighted average yield of that. What, uh, what levels of your organization structure has staff attrition affected? I think uh, all of us have been affected by high staff attrition. The entire industry is uh, faced with that challenge. But that's where one is uh, redeploying of our staff. The flexibility of uh, moving staff uh, is also uh, an advantage that we had thanks to some of the digital uh, process improvement that we have made. So that has helped despite the staff attrition to manage the level of service manager uh, to continue the level of transactions. But still, all in all, the staff attrition remains a challenge for the entire industry. There's another question, Miran, if ISVs are given option to accept in LKR, does it mean there will be a reversal in provisions? Which are already made. Yes, again. Uh, you know, once again, the same answer. Yes. <laughs> of course. 
and and by the way the even the reason rupee appreciation also has increased the provision cover now whatever the december isp related provisions that banks have made that was based on exchange rate of probably 365 right so when the exchange rate reduced that rupee it's because the provisions are held in rupees so the provision cover has improved There's a question whether the staff attrition affected the credit control department more than the others. Uh, not really. And in fact, we are beefing up the credit control function the media unit uh, to ensure that's an area that we need to focus. So these are the, all the questions that we have received, right? Okay. So these are the, all the questions that we have received. So thank you very much for all these interesting questions. And I hope the presentation was useful for you all to understand more about the bank. And we continue to maintain these investor relations to the quarterly webinars. And thank you for taking part and asking these right questions. And thank you for your participation. And uh, hopefully, with next week's IMF announcement and some clarity provided, you we have a better picture about how you move forward. Uh, bank is getting ready, and uh, I'm sure the investor community is also looking forward to that. Uh, so, while thanking your participation and thanking my fellow panelists here, I would like to conclude this investor webinar. Thank you very much.